in this episode of the Critical Oxygen Podcast. So the cool thing about mitochondria is the shape within a given cell takes on a, a shape that's convenient to the energetic need. And because muscle is striated, we have a muscle fiber, it, it's the longest cell in the human body, mitochondria adapt to fit the energetic need for this long cylindrical cylindrical cell that has this network across the muscle and so it creates a network of reticular ch uh, channels tube like structures throughout the muscle hi everyone welcome back to the critical oxygen podcast where we help you optimize your physiology and maximize your athletic potential I'm your host, Phil Batterson, and today we're joined by continuing guest host, Dr. Robbie Jacobs, where we're going to discuss how our mitochondria adapt to exercise. Robbie Jacobs, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. Do you ever watch Saturday Night Live? Uh, or, or did like, you watch Saturday Night Live in the past, I should say? Like, I, I don't really... sporadically. Did you ever see the skit where, I forget her name, but she would be, she played a radio host and she was all calm. Oh and, no! I, that's what it reminds me of when you when you when you do the intro. She's like, "Hi and welcome back to the show," and <laughs> she's all calm. That's what it reminds me of. Does, you have a very I, good I, radio voice. I obviously do not. No, I think I think people enjoy the podcast that we have together. So something must be going right. You well, know, that's if, good. <laughs> um, yeah, that was. Uh, I I think wh what's the what's the adage like you have a voice for ra or a face for radio or something like that too. Like, <laughs> me, yeah, me, face me, for me. radio. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning... I don't think I have that, but I hope not. But uh, yeah, we'll see. I I can't say anything because I probably don't either. It's all right. Well, you know, the only people who would be enjoying our faces anyways would be on YouTube. Anyways, we're not creating an OnlyFans or anything like that. Yet. <laughs> Yet. Yet. <laughs> well, we no, need, I mean. We need progress, something to work towards. Yeah. But, and, and you know, like, uh, OnlyFans has a bad name. Let's be honest here. But this could be a hot take. But OnlyFans, right, you know, it's, it's, it's. A lot of the times people uh, dabbling in the adult industry, those sort of things. But it was really created for the people who were fans of the people and wanted to support them. So yeah. that's nothing different than a Patreon. Yeah, exactly. So, but <laughs> I don't think, I don't think that's the first thing we're going to do if we decide to launch like a crowd funded or crowd supported uh, app, even though I don't know what the fees are, but Patreon, it's like 8%. Per month, that you know take. what I would pay for on an OnlyFans account when they would go and take people and try to get them to do multiple win gates repeatedly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be awesome. <laughs> It'd just be called the Pain Cave. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You I could watch that all day long. Well, I mean, that's like that's like how uh, you know guys like Rob Deerdick and uh, you know like America's Funniest Home Videos and stuff like. Oh made yeah, their thing is like you know based on people's like. You know, it was like people suffering, but of course, you know, like they had to vet the videos to make sure the people didn't like die in it. It's like, yeah, you know, if, if Wingate tests, those are pretty freaking painful. That's wild. So, Is that the name of the host of uh, America's Funniest Home Videos? No, Rob Deerdick has his own and I can't remember what it's called, but it was on MTV and they oh. essentially did oh, the exact same thing. Right. Yeah. I know who you're talking about now. Yeah, totally. It's pretty. Where it's they pretty would funny. Play those funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. It, 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 it's it's you know it's it's very uh, you know up the alley of America's Funniest Home Videos. You know, f like the fail videos that people do, um, all of that sort of stuff. So pretty entertaining. But yeah, I don't. I, I I'm not gonna do repeated Wingate tests for your guys's entertainment if I don't have to. <laughs> I well exactly if I don't have to. If if I was getting paid, I, I think I would do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it would be you know, it you could just call it block periodization and then just do Wingate tests every other day and then you switch to like VO2 max tests every other day and then you switch to, you know, a step test every other day. Um there's actually so speaking of that, there's a paper that I just read that was out of uh Dr. Billy Spurlick's lab. He's the guy who does all the training intensity distributions and all of that, but Whoever the first author on the Is paper. Is he in Germany? 
Did you yeah. say he's in Germany? Yeah. I just came across his name for something, and I remembered his name, and I was wondering where I remembered it from, and I yeah. think it's from you. Actually. Yeah, yeah. He, him and I had a really good conversation about all of that, and he, he's kind of into wearables and stuff now, but uh, I, I presume it was like a PhD student or a master's student decided to do this uh, this paper where they wanted to do repeated VO2 max tests. Yes. Th- so it was three days a week. Yes, they did I a did VO2 max the, test for nine for nine weeks, and it was it was really cool because they were trying to figure out what like the variability in the measurements were. Um, so they took you know maximal heart rate, maximal power output, time to exhaustion during the actual step test, um, maximal lactate values, RPE, all of this sort of stuff. Also sub maximal RPE. So then they had like a coefficient of variation. And the coefficient of variation for things like heart rate, um, it was, what was it? Yeah, yeah, the, there, yeah. Maximal heart rate, um, maximal power, other things like that were pretty tight. It was, yep. you know, within like blood two to lactate's three percent. The worst. It, it's absolutely. the most variable. It guess guess what far. it was? Do you remember? Seventeen or eighteen percent? Yeah, eighteen percent. How do I remember this? I have no idea. I'm remembering that I've already kind of looked at this article yeah. as you're describing it. Yeah. Well, no. So it's, it, <laughs> you always question, you know, it's like, oh, am I actually smart? It's like, well, you can at least remember like things you read from papers <laughs> right, a little right, bit. <laughs> right. <laughs> so yeah, 18% in terms of maximal lactate values. And it's it's interesting because, I mean, that it's not surprising, I think, to to you or I based on how lactate what lactate is responding to it's responding to a lot of different inputs um but from the perspective of like you know being able to detect biological changes an 18 percent in variation is like insanely high yeah so high resolution respirometry is pretty high it's around 15 percent variation yeah. Yeah, but so a, a lot of a lot of muscle measures. If you look at like fiber typing, if, if you look a lot, the wet lab procedures, um, assays and stuff, often have something like twenty, sometimes thirty percent variance. Yeah. like citrate synthase. This is why citrate synthase is a terrible biomarker of mitochondrial content. Is because it's so variable. When when I first got introduced to like. Uh, wet lab procedures western blotting and those sort of things i would get like i would get these measurements that were like like the the variability were just absolutely astronomical right and it's like okay well how are you actually supposed to detect any changes in physiological variables other than like making your sample size huge or trying to you know pare things down so you know that it it actually looks like you're getting changes and something that really ticked me off is when people put, um, what is it? It's it's not COVID, it's a standard error of the mean. So so if you're ever looking at graphs and you see really, really tight error bars, look down in the, in the actual description and if it says SEM, that means that they're actually only displaying one third of the variance in the actual sample, um, it, which is standard error of the mean versus uh, standard deviation. Um, and it's a good way of kind of tricking people to think that you actually have tighter data than you actually have. So that, that is one of my biggest pet peeves. And actually, like, my people in my lab would do it, and I would call them out, and they would still just continue to do it because that's really? – Yeah, that was just kind of like the standard. Um, I never did it. I was like, I was like nope, I'm going to report standard deviations, and then I'll just say it's standard deviations, and then people can interpret it the way that they want. Yeah, exactly. <sighs> Um, and Western blots, another thing is it's a two day process. Mm-hmm. And so if you get Could to be the a three end, day process sometimes. Yeah, exactly. And if you get to the end and something didn't go right, okay. You aren't always <laughs> aware of where did I go wrong in these last two or three days. Yeah. Like what amongst all these multitude of different steps, which one do I need to change or fix yeah. or which one went wrong and yeah that that was brutal yeah that was like the most frustrating thing is you just spent you know a week doing all these western blots and stuff and then for some reason the transfer didn't work or you like got fingerprints on something so it like or it was just messy like the blots were just messy and yeah. then it was like oh yeah just do it again next week it's like are you kidding me okay. like 
I don't have time for that. I don't have time to do another thing, you know, that should be done next week. And that's what I think that was one of the biggest frustrations I had with just like uh, wet lab sort of work is that it's just this revolving door of just like, oh, do it again to see if you get a different result, essentially. And you need to keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. And then as opposed to like applied physiology stuff, like, you know, like what we were doing or like my human study where it's like, yeah, you got one shot to get the to get the measurements right. And if you don't get them right, you, you have to throw out the data or you just get them right because you're meticulous about what you're actually doing. Yeah. So uh, the frustrations of, of the wet lab stuff. That's why there it, it, takes, <clears throat> it takes a certain type of person that I really admire to be able to just sit down in a wet lab and be able to do this stuff and, and effectively do it with low – uh, you know, coefficients of variation and everything. Um, it's not for me. <laughs> me too. I so I actually think that my master's advisor Karen Hamilton and one your PhD advisor Matt Robinson are very similar because I think both of them prefer being in the lab. They love that mm -hmm. stuff. They will oh, yeah, be Matt, in the Matt lab. Was all about it. Yeah. Yep. And those uh, when you find people like that, you tend to notice that they're um quality of their lab work is pretty good yeah like r they're very meticulous keep really good notes you know all of that and it's again it, it's admirable because it's i am not that type of person i'm not that organized um i'm i i don't know i don't know if it's like a like a novelty thing or a patience thing or like whatever it is but it's just really hard for me to do the same step, especially like if you're doing PCR and you have you know 300 and what 28 well plate, like you could have you know the tiniest little you know 10 microliter tubes, 50 microliter tubes, and you're doing like you know 96 samples or something like that, and it's just it's tedious. So I love how I don't know if I love I am very repetitive. But that doesn't make it easier for me because it makes it more difficult. Like mm -hmm. when you were working with me, things had to be a certain way. And then it just makes but, there introduces more stress into the I hate no, I hate worrying that every single T is crossed and I is dotted. I think you know, so so something that I learned, you know, during my masters is like there's a time and a place to focus on, you know, certain details, right? Um, and I, and I, that's something that actually that I've carried through is like, you know, whenever I'm talking with somebody about, you know, something, whether it's like editing a paper, making a presentation, whatever it is, if we're getting off into the weeds of just like, oh, well you, you misspelled this or, you know, you, we could use a different word. I'm like, we haven't even figured out what the story is yet. So we need to figure that out first and then we can get into like the super nitty gritty details. So, you know, you're like, well, is, and when you said that, I actually, I actually re remember specifically, I think I was doing like a practice masters, you know, presentation or something like that. And I was like, okay, guys, I'm looking for big picture concepts, you know, help with this, that, and the other. And you had a list, I think probably of like six or seven slides where you were like, well, you need to take that title and you need to move it over three pixels or you need to move it down four pixels. And I was like, I, what I wanted to say is just like, like Dr. Jacobs, I, I, I thank you. I appreciate it. But well, big picture. Totally. I think I, I bet you uh, Kayla, my, one of my past grad students probably feels the same. I, I can't get out of my own way. That's yeah. I just see that stuff all the time, but I also miss it too. Sometimes when I see a article that's published, uh, of mine i'll find the mistakes immediately and I'll i like, Damn so it. so that's that's a perfect <laughs> juxtaposition to the paper that we read about mitochondrial adaptation there was a i can't remember what the there was a typo in like the first sentence always there's yeah. always is was there really it, it, it was like okay i think it was it was like the second paragraph on the first page or something like that if you're looking it up but yeah i well, was like that's probably going to drive me nuts. I can't remember. I'll I'll find it for you. So I don't want to detract too much from the conversation. I, I find probably. I find mistakes often. I wish I had this little editor sitting on my shoulder. Mm -hmm. But then again, I've seen um, publications come out of really good labs and really good uh, journals where like something in the title is spelled wrong. Yeah. 
<laughs> I know it's, and it's funny. It's funny how our brains kind of like you know just like glom onto that, right? <laughs> right, right. You're like, you're like, oh my gosh, like now everyone's gonna think I'm an idiot. And like every once in a while, you know, I find myself like having those thoughts, and I'm just like, it's actually not that big of a deal because I'm gonna read that sentence. I know what it's supposed to say, and then I'm just gonna continue on. And you may be the only one that notices. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Um. So yeah, you wanna you wanna or so I wanna I wanna finish out the that conversation from the the paper that I brought up about you know variability and stuff within measurements because that's important, um, you know, for anybody you know to to know. So for example, if we have we have athletes and stuff on here who do things like functional threshold power tests, you know, twenty minutes all out as hard as you can, or maybe like forty five minutes all out as hard as you can. It's important to know how much variation would happen if you came back and did an FTP every single day or every other day, because you want to be able to say with confidence, Oh, my FTP went from 200 to 250. Is that because of variance or is that because I actually got better at whatever te- at the, at the test that I'm doing or my physiology got better? Um, so that was the point that I wanted to bring up is, you know, it's, it's just important to know, that every measurement has some level of variability. But if you're repeating the same measurement in a similar fashion over and over and over, then you're hopefully minimizing the amount of variability that you're introducing into that measurement. And then from there, you can actually say, is that measurement trending in a positive way, a negative way? And is that above the amount of variance that I would expect? So the last thing that they did is they said, okay, if we're looking at changes to things like VO2, heart rate, lactate, other things like that, how many days of training would we need to notice a difference that was beyond the uh, the measurement variance. Or, or variance? Exactly. And for submaximal heart rate, it was like nine days. So that's like that's like yeah, nine days would only be like five tests or something, five VO2 max tests. So there was a training effect for maximal submaximal heart rate that was detectable within nine days which that, is like that's what i find most interesting with that study because i literally mm-hmm. wanted to conduct a study earlier doing the same thing like regular vo2 max tests so that you can try to uh quantify the training effect from a vo2 max test mm-hmm. exactly because right. there are some studies that incorporate vo2 max tests a lot and so how much of the adaptation may be coming from the VOT max test versus the, the program, the programmed or programmatic exercise right. that, that they're doing. Right. And so that also is super interesting to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, I was actually very intrigued by the fact that submaximal heart rate, you know, was the, the first thing to be detected. And then there was another one that was like, uh, I think it was like RPE or time to exhaustion or something like that. I know those are greatly different, but it might've been time to exhaustion. That was like, uh, 15 days, but then VO two changes in VO two maximal VO two were actually like 21 days. So it took three weeks worth of testing in order to detect a change that was greater than very, like the variability. That's a cool study. You know, what's crazy is that I don't, think that there was ever a time they were actually able to determine a change in uh maximal lactate because of the variability within the within the measures so for those of you who do use lactate just take that with a grain of salt um it's it's just kind of more you know fodder uh you know for for me you know to basically say is like uh, i don't know if i've said this on the air but i'll say it right now is like i think that lactate is a little bit of an archaic measurement that is should be going by the wayside, especially with all, all the coaches I've talked to so many people with so many different things is like, it's, it, it's, it's challenging from like a, you know, you have to draw blood. So, you know, if you're doing a test on yourself, then it's like, okay, you're pricking your finger. I don't know, 10, 20 times you're drawing blood and then putting it on a strip 10 or 20 times you're wiping it off. So you have potential blood everywhere. If you're doing testing in a lab, then you have to deal with like the blood and you know, that sort of stuff being around. And, um, you know, so, so for me, it's just like the, the challenges with it don't weigh, outweigh the the positives. That's, that's what I'm trying to get at. And to be accurate with lactate testing, 
you have to have experience. And so there's going to mm -hmm. be a learning curve that's a lot bigger with when you're using lactate. Some of these coaches, some of these researchers that have been doing lactate for years, I do not doubt that they're not good with it. They're probably amongst the best users of lactate. Right. To, in order to diagnose and prescribe and, and all that. But the, the hill to join them is a big one. <laughs> yes. And, and if there are other means by which you can get the same information with less or variability. Si or similar information. Or right? similar, yeah. yeah. Similar information with less variability, um, less of a learning curve. Why not? Yeah. And that's that's kind of how I think of it is like, if what you have to remember what it's like what are you trying to measure there's nothing special about lactate as a molecule like it it's one metabolite that is coming from you know the breakdown of glycolysis or the breakdown of glucose in glycolysis and it's been shown to correlate with shifts away from oxidative metabolism and correlated with fatigue and all of this other stuff but that's because we couldn't measure what was actually going on in terms of oxygen consumption at the muscle at that time. It was the best way of us getting a surrogate for energetic stress. And now we have things like, like NEARS, for example, and NEARS isn't perfect. Um, you know, it's like one of the limitations is the fact that you're only measuring one small muscular area and you're then maybe extrapolating that to, to whole body changes, but it's still from we do with muscle biopsies. Yeah, we do it with muscle biopsies. We do it with Western blotting. We do it with, you know, like literally all of those things that you see within the, in the research, in the literature, fiber typing, like all of that. And we make then these, I, I think the big thing is, is you just have to like, you have to, you have to make sure you stay in your lane. Like what is, what is heart rate telling us? What is NEARS telling us with SMO2 or THB? What is lactate actually telling us? You have to remember what is a measurement telling you. And then from there, you can make more informed decisions and say, okay, well, I know that you know shifts in in say skeletal muscle oxygenation, like if it's continually decreasing, it's going to indicate to me, you know, based on my physiology brain, that cardiac delivery or oxygen delivery is less than the amount of oxygen that we're actually using. That's why oxygenation within the tissue is actually falling. That could be one explanation. There's other explanations for it too. So it's just it's just one of those things where, you know, it's. I, I think there's better ways, but I'm not going to throw, you know, the baby out with the bathwater. I think, you know, I am backpedaling again, but it's, if you're looking at, you know, things like carbohydrate, uh, loading and readiness to exercise, I think that that is one valuable thing is somebody of, uh, does somebody have high carbohydrate availability or low carbohydrate av availability? That's something that you can't tell with really anything else, Right. And that would be apparent if you were did like a step test or something and your lactate values never rise. If your lactate levels never rise, that means that you probably don't have many carbohydrates on board. And if you don't have many carbohydrates on board, that most likely means that you're probably not able to reach maximal performance because you don't have as much glycolytic flux going on. So that is one of the few things that I think lactate could be good for, but there's so many different caveats and I've, the, the most questions I've gotten from people are like, oh, you know, like, uh, you know, I did a, I did a lactate test and I never got above four millimolars. So they never determined my second threshold. I was like, well, did you go to go till failure? They're like, oh yeah, I went to till failure. I was like, okay, well, obviously that's above your second threshold then. So, you know, why didn't they use something different? You know, a second inflection point or something along those lines. Um, and then I start to ask them, oh, well, how many carbohydrates do you eat? How much fat do you eat? She's like, well, I'm primarily, you know, like more on the fat side of things, or you know, not the fat side of things, but I eat more fat, eat less carbohydrates. I'm typically running a calorie deficit because I'm trying to lose weight right now. It's like, okay, well, all of these things are adding up to me to be like, yeah, no, no, duh. You're not going to be able to create much lactate in your blood because you just simply don't have the carbohydrates available to you because of all of those reasons. You're exercising a lot. You're in a, a deficit. You're not eating a lot of carbohydrates. So it makes sense that you wouldn't be able to elevate that. Well, and that four millimoles is so arbitrary, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm writing up research right now and where uh, the exercise coordinator that was conducting the exercise tests that included lactate profiling uh, during exercise 
they would anticipate that certain measures towards the end of exercise were going to be four millibols, but it'd be like 3.8. And so in order not to lose sample size, instead of making that cut off four millimoles, we made it three millimoles. And guess what? Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I know. It, it's just as, it's just as the, the correlation to performance is just as strong. Yeah. As past research has shown with four millimoles. It, I want to go back and I want to dig into the history. If anyone knows like why people started using two and four millimole, like, you know, was it just, is it, is there one seminal paper that used two and four and then it just got kind of continued or one lab? I have a feeling. Yeah. I like, bet. yeah, let me, let us know. Uh, let me know in the DM or, you know, either comments on YouTube or, or DM, D DM me on Instagram and I'd be the DMs. Are you them. inviting people to slide into your DMs? Is yeah, that what but you only do? With... You invite them? Say, hey, <laughs> but only... slide but... into my DMs. <laughs> but only, but only with uh, scientific inquiries. Those are the, <laughs> those are the only things that are allowed to pass that threshold. Um... <laughs> <laughs> all right let's 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 dive not into the dms but deeper into the mitochondria here and let's talk about how our mitochondria actually adapt to exercise because i think I, I this is this is the topic that you and i i think you know want to talk about and you wrote a cool review uh, it was like a symposium review back in what 2016 yeah with carson um, i mean my my yeah. phd advisor was the one that was uh, invited to to write this review mm -hmm. that was largely based on a uh, my PhD work, which um, what was a lot. I was I was very lucky to work with Karsten Lumby, who did mm -hmm. his PhD with Bank Saltine. Um, tremendous wealth of knowledge, tremendous wealth of opportunity, and I tried to take uh, every advantage. And so when Karsten was invited to write this review, he, he, he asked me to join. So this mm -hmm. is pr more, I would say more Karsten's review, uh, mm -hmm. but, I, but I'm on it. Yeah. I, I don't think, you know, it's, it's a cool paper though. And the, the point is, it holds is, up is well. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I, I was rereading it and, um, you know, I think there's there's a lot of terms especially in the in the athletic world that are kind of thrown around in terms of uh the mi mitochondria right you know people are you know it's like the first thing you always ask mitochondria what are they they're the powerhouse of the cell okay yeah yeah, yeah. We, we we got past that i think we reviewed that on the last episode is you know the mitochondria are the place that's making the majority of the energy or the the energy provisions or energy currency that is required for skeletal muscle contraction to be occurring and skeletal and contraction is what actually allows us to do locomotion whatever activity we want to do but the thing is is like that dancing you know, like dancing mm. like running like cycling like swimming like literally any activity is going to require some amount of contractile force and that force is only going to be able to be made by the breakdown of atp liberating that energy from that third phosphate bond and then it's replenished that ATP, that energy currency on, on the whole, the majority of it is repl replenished by oxidative phosphorylation, which occurs within the mitochondria. The awesome thing about the mitochondria and the awesome thing about the human body, I think in general, that I think you and I both really appreciate a lot is the fact that we're not just a machine. If you stress the human body, speak for yourself. Well, I okay. So, in an ideal world, that's that's what the human body would be as a machine that is like self adaptive, right? But the cool thing about the human body is that it is self adaptive. So, if you place a stress on the human body and allow adequate recovery or adequate rest, then the human body is actually able to become better. And we, we see this across the board with things like, you know, if, if somebody did a lot of strength training, like muscle hypertrophy, you get bigger muscles because you need to generate more force in order to accomplish the tasks that you're, you're requiring your muscle to do. The cool thing about endurance training is you still get a similar, uh, you still get hypertrophy, but you get mitochondrial hypertrophy. So you actually get enlargement of the mitochondria and let's i, I want to dispel a myth real quick so um in the textbooks and this is a question for you robbie is in the textbooks how are mitochondria generally depicted like like what's the shape? shaped organelle yep so so is that actually true though when you depends look on at, the tissue so okay i was going to say when you look at the skeletal structures. muscle mitochondria yeah nope skeletal muscle mitochondria they are uh it's a network 
it's a it's a network of almost like vessels like you would think of blood vessels mm-hmm. uh, so the cool thing about mitochondria is the shape within a given cell takes on a, a shape that's convenient to the energetic need and because muscle is striated we have a muscle fiber it, it's the longest cell in the human body mitochondria adapt to fit the energetic need for this long cylindrical cylindrical cell that has this network across the muscle and so it creates a network of reticular ch- uh, channels tube like structures throughout the muscle yeah it's it's really really cool if you can ever look up like scanning electron microscope uh pictures of the mitochondria it really does it looks like a like like capillary beds like the the way you would envision a capillary bed or the way that i think about it is just like you know we all like in big cities you have you know like the 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 sewer networks right that's exactly what the mitochondria look like and they overlap with you know the roads so the mitochondria are going yeah. to look very similar to how you know the the skeletal muscle is laid out and that's you know mainly because the mitochondria are adapting to the energetic needs of whatever cell that it's in and when it's in skeletal muscle cell it's going to look like that uh highly striated um you know sort of sort of branched network and um something that people may also not know is that there are different populations of mitochondria so depending on where the mitochondria are situated within the muscle cell they actually serve different purposes skeletal or mitochondria that are more on the 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 edges of the cell would be that would be your your subsarcolemmal mitochondria and Kinda those like are subsar or a uh, subcutaneous fat fat that's yeah. right underneath the skin right yeah. this, these are mitochondrial populations that are right underneath the plasma membrane and that's why they're called subsarcolemmal cuz it's the sarcolemma is the plasma membrane of the muscle cell mm-hmm. and those so those are going to be highly um used for things like atp provision for skeletal muscle contraction you also have another population called your imf intramyofibular right am i getting am i getting this right so uh, the provision of the sodium potassium pumps is pr- primarily for the sarcoplasmic they they're oh. probably providing the atp yeah. that that keeps the sarcolemma excitable so that if we're getting uh repeated stimuli from the innervating alpha motor neuron that it, it keeps our uh, muscle excitable the inner myofibrillar mitochondria tend to be the ones that are providing atp that's helping to sustain contraction the actin myosin cross bridge mm-hmm. recycling and the sodium i mean the the calcium pump the circa pump yep yeah, so flip those around a little bit uh, in my mind. Um, but yeah, so su- super interesting, super important. And they, they to, get, to get even crazier, they also adapt at different rates. And there's different yeah. percentages of those. And we don't, we don't have to get into that because that's pretty because much a Because the mo- demand for ATP is different, right? Yeah. The most energetic, costly events during contraction – Myosin, actin, uh, cross bridge recycling, mm-hmm. as well as the the circa pump. Yep, exactly. So you want to have uh, robust populations of, of of both, but they're going to match the energetic or the ATP demand that is that are placed upon them. Um, so okay, so now we have this reti- this vast reticular network of of mitochondria, and you know, and I hear this term here's the myth that I wanted to get to. I hear this term of mitochondrial biogenesis being thrown around a lot. It so if still we actually, is. It's still I, used so often. And yeah. I'm surprised. So, so the definition of biogenesis would be, you know, the creation of new, just, you know, creation of new, right? And if we actually think about it, we're not actually just creating new mitochondria we're we're building onto those reticular networks so we're expanding the networks and but if you do think about mitochondria as kind of like those bean shaped organelles then it makes sense that you're saying oh maybe it is actually biogenesis we're actually adding new ones but 
when we actually take a, a more holistic look and a more holistic approach to looking at how the mitochondria adapt, it's actually not how it's happening. It's these reticular networks are being built and fused and built on top of each other and fused more. And it's, it's through that, it's, it's actually mitochondrial hypertrophy that is happening. You're getting more mitochondria. Well, we'll get into the nitty gritty of this in a little bit, but you're getting more mitochondria, but it's, it's more of that reticular network again, to meet the energy needs of whatever demand is being placed on it. So when you're doing a lot of endurance activity, you're going through a lot of ATP. That's what it comes down to. So you need very, very vast connected mitochondrial reticular networks in order to actually uh, meet those energetic needs as quickly as possible. And again, I'm going to keep saying it. This is where I think like, you know, for, from a strength training perspective, you get myofibular hypertrophy from a endurance perspective, you get mitochondrial hypertrophy. So it's hypertrophy on the same, you know, to the same extent, it's just what organelle or what uh, group of proteins is actually being expanded upon. Well, and uh, to strip even more nuance away, I would love to compare the skeletal muscle hypertrophy of the type one, formerly known as slow twitch fibers f for like, say, take professional cyclists and put mm -hmm. them with the cross-sectional area of, I would love to see this slow twitch fibers from like American football players. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if the endurance athletes either had as big cross-sectional area, if not bigger than um, mm -hmm. who we would consider strength and power athletes. So the ability for slow twitch fibers to hypertrophy, it, it does happen. It's just you need a more chronic stimulus like with something that you get with like endurance training. Mm -hmm. I would say I, I would challenge that notion about football players, and I would say bodybuilders would totally. probably have. That's easy, right? Because yeah. they're, they're yeah. not doing the the daily activity probably necessary to grow those. I want to create shirts that say I have big ass slow twitch fibers. That's what <laughs> I want to create a line of shirt that says I have big ass uh, slow twitch fibers. Or uh, I, I'd, I'd, uh, I've always thought about, you know, mitochondrial hypertrophy as, you know, like just like uh, the bean shaped mitochondrial organ now with just like big old muscles. Yeah. Big old yeah, that's muscles good too. just like, stre like flexing. We need to have a, mito a brand of mitochondrial shirts. Yeah. Yeah. That would be. <laughs> that would, that would be fun. We could we could definitely uh, the uh, the axis of oxidation. Now with you know Chat GPT and all that sort of stuff, we could probably generate so many ideas so fast. I'm gonna start using that in in my publications. The Do axis it. of oxidation. You, you you need to you need to coin it, and then in the acknowledgments, you need to say you know thanks for Phil Batterson. Thanks to Phil Batterson for helping me. <laughs> yeah, with this idea because you were like this this uh, oxidation alignment. Axis, axis of, of ox oxidation i know it's it, it there's there's so many things that i want to do going forward with like the uh like the podcast and stuff that are related to that and uh mid journey version six just came out um it, it, for those of you who are unfamiliar this is all just like ai image software or just ai uh, you know in general and there you're actually able to make like comics and stuff like that now Really? It. I need yeah. to, I need to work with me. I've never worked with mid journey. So, so I have a subscription. Awesome. Yeah. I have a subscription to mid journey, but the problem or the challenge is, is that it's not like chat GPT where you can't just, or it wasn't like chat GPT. Like the, the way you communicated with it was slightly different. Um, so, but now you have to speak Spanish. Uh, yeah. You know, some, some, you know, it's, it's just different because you have, you know, like, uh, you know, colons and, and apostrophes oh. and other things like that, that like will go into it at certain points and it, it changes the way that mid journey actually like weights different portions of the text and all of that. Um, so there's almost more of a coding necessary for the input than it's with... just a, yeah, it's just a different, like, it, it's just a different language and the verbiage is just slightly different. It's kind hmm. of, I mean, it's kind of like with any sort of, you know, prompt engineering or anything like that. It's like, if you know how to speak to whatever AI that you're interacting with, you're able to get your outputs a lot better. So, um, do you see I'm... positions for prompt engineers are being are are popping up across companies for like a oh, yeah. hundred to two hundred thousand dollars per year? 
I know it's cra it's crazy, but I don't. But how the here's the question though is how long are those jobs going to actually last? As long because as uh, non fungible token analysts, as long as that. Remember NFTs? Oh yeah. Remember NFTs in like 2021 were a huge thing. They're like, oh, you got to the get thing. these NFTs. An NFT analyst, they were hired. Then they were fired. <laughs> exactly. So I think that's going to be the same thing with prompt engineers because they're essentially yeah, I like agree. they're the boss is going to ask them, hey, make me a GPT that does this, this, and this. <laughs> and then they're going to work themselves out of a job. Totally. And they're going to be like, okay, well, cool. $200,000. You're only a quarter way through the year. <laughs> totally. But I'm laughing, but I work with ChatGPT so much that I'm slowly working myself out of a job because I already think it's a better educator than I could ever be. Well, the way, the way that I think about it is that <clears> – <throat> there there is still the need for human connection sure, and sure. there's still a need for human creativity in order to actually like have right like like Absolutely. this right you we're never yep. going to get to a point where people are going well i can't say never but you know having a conversation you know is is something that makes us human having like ideas and other things like that so i think what ai is really going to allow people who are willing to take it on to do is to actually focus and settle into that creativity sort of style of things and have all of like the other BS fall away. I hope so. That sounds wonderful. Yeah. So it's like, it's like it, kind of like what you were saying is use AI as your, uh, you know, assistant, you know, your personal, your own it's, personal it's my brace. assistant. It's my, yeah. Assistant. It's my personal <laughs> brace. Totally. Yeah. And then, and then the good thing is, is that, you know, people who are like, you know, thought leaders have the ability to grow exactly like what you're talking about are going to be the ones that are going to stay ahead of, you know, the, the uh, obsolescence that could happen if you just say, oh, yep, you know, uh, my, chat GPT took, took my job because I mean, if you, if you actually think about it, what we could do is we could take the entire body of P or of, uh, of literature Download them as PDFs, upload them into ChatGPT, and then essentially have a searchable, uh, you know, encyclopedia of of physiology knowledge, and say, "This is the question that I have based on what's in your body of knowledge. What is the answer to it?" It'd be so interesting if that happened. I wonder if there is so much information that is opposing one another. I, I wonder what? how it would have come out with the answer. Chat Chat GPT is going to eventually sound like us being yeah, like, oh exactly. well, it de it depends. Totally, like, <laughs> right? It's gonna be, <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be like it's gonna be like, well, you know, it's like, what's the best diet for for weight loss? And it's gonna be like, well, it depends. You know, do you do you enjoy eating meat? Are, are you against eating meat? You know, like what this, that, and the other. Here's the here's the evidence for this. Here's the evidence for that. And that's, you know, that's what uh, Examine dot com really helped do for me. Is it doesn't give you the answer. It gives you the. Um, the pros and cons of like what it is. So it's like, for example, hey, I'm thinking about taking creatine. You can go and you can look at like a smatter, like all of the research that's out there and say, okay, this is what on average creatine supplementation looks like. It seems to be helping this, this, and this. And okay, based on that decision, I think I'm going to try to take creatine because that, you know, because it hits those things. I think that's what chat gpt could or you know just just ai in general could help us with and yep. at the end of the day though i i also think too it's like okay well if if ai is out there and is able to do the majority of things for us that means we just work less and like so or we work the same amount but on more things that's probably what I would end up doing. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's like, I think that's also American work culture, right? right it's totally. like, you know, it's like, well, I have to work eight hours a day. So I might, you know, so I might as well do that. But I wouldn't be surprised if there are people out there who use, you know, things like AI and chat GPT to make it so they only have to really work 30 minutes a day. Well, sure. Um, and then they're just like, yep. And now I'm going to take back my life because yep. I got my, my AI doing all the stuff that is like, fairly pointless um so so yeah that i mean 
that was a that was a little bit of a digression, but I do think that it will be important. Like, for example, it'll be interesting to see, and I, I really do think this that this would be possible. It's not quite there. There's another AI, and I can't remember what it's called, but like you can it actually has access to things like PubMed and and other things like that. I think it's only either the the freely accessible articles or the abstracts. So you can search in like what is the best protocol for VO2 max training. It doesn't give you a really good answer right now, but it does like populate, you know, some of like the seminal papers in what would what would help you answer that question. Yep. Or so, it will give you a bullshit answer that sounds fantastic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's uh with uh with with great knowledge or great AI comes great responsibility as well because yeah. I I also think I think we're we're going it, to it'll be something where it's like you know, like students and stuff are going to start writing, you know, their papers on, on chat GPT and then putting it through like a bunch of filters to make it so it doesn't sound AI. And there's going to be ways of kind of detecting that. But then also, you know, we might have to just go back to pop quizzes. It's like test somebody's knowledge. Hey guys. All right. If you've been paying attention in class, you'll probably be able to answer this question better than most. So just put a slide up and just be like, all right, write down your answer. No phones, no nothing. Um, Pop quizzes might be might not be a thing of the past anymore. They might come back. <laughs> Sounds like a skill to muscle fizz. A little bit, yeah. No, I, I, I don't know if we read this review in in that, but that was the, the mitochondria review. No, yeah. I, I typically tried to keep most my research out of my teaching because I don't know. It makes me feel like. Like, come here, kids. Let me teach you everything I know and read all my papers. Like, yeah. I don't know. It just, it seems I, I should still be able to get what I say in the papers in my studies across with other research, but I have been incorporating more and more of my research into my teaching. Yeah. It just felt kind of dirty at first. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't, I don't think it is because like, well, I would say here, this is what I would say. If, if you have students that you expect to read your papers, but you don't ever assign your papers to them, right. then it's unfair for you to assume that they've actually read all of your papers. Yeah. Um, Are you speaking from experience? No, no. I'm just thinking about like, like how it could easily be done that way. Right. You know, like totally. if, you, if you get into somebody's lab and they're just like, Oh, so what do you know about all my papers and stuff? It's like, well, you know, I've, I've scanned the abstract from, you know, probably 30 of them. But other than that, like, That's I didn't even know, point. I didn't even know that Matt was one of the first ones that showed statins, you know, were, had, had issue or were negatively affecting. From what I understand. Yeah. Muscle. I think that was the first paper I had ever heard on it. Hmm. Yeah. It was like so, a review that I think he did with Ben Miller and Karen Hamilton. Yeah. So, so yeah, I never knew that he even, you know, did something like that. Um, it takes me back. A poor uh, Cole was one of my past grad students, and one of my first comments when I was revising his thesis was like, "Hey, buddy. Um, so it's standard practice to try to incorporate some of previous work that we've done into the current work that we're trying to publish." Because he was just referencing everybody else's work yeah it started to hurt my ego and so yeah. i was like hey you're like put some it, of my research in there yeah didn't any of my research <laughs> pop up when i was yeah. when, you were, when you were searching exactly or or did you ever consider to con like think of mine when when yeah. we, you're like hmm i need a reference for this what should i look up yeah. but you make a good point right if if you're not familiar with that world why would that be something you consider yeah i mean you know and for the most part right it's going to come down to what you what you find on google scholar or pubmed you right. know based on whatever questions you're asking it yeah and it can i think just based off of how people write or how people what people put in uh titles like you can get much different results right you know com comparatively and that is something that i I know this is a crazy digression down, you know, like like research and and AI and stuff like that. But I think <clears throat> something that that researchers could really learn a lot from is SEO, uh, search engine op optimization, and figuring out not not like over the top clickbaity titles, but titles that are going to actually answer questions that people are going to ask. 
Right. Um, as opposed to like, like, like for example. Like Pluribus Anum? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know. Ours, nobody. I love um, it though. Because if you look up the Latin meaning, it's out of all, one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I know. It may, it makes sense, but that's more of a book title than a, <laughs> you know, than like a, a paper title. Right. Um, so, you know, so, and that drives me nuts with some people's, uh, you know, publications like, oh, the, the effects of blah, 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 blah on blah, 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 blah. And you're like, well, what are the effects? Just tell me what the answer is. Oh, I hate it when they write that way in the paper. That, oh, it, like it the amb- so ambiguity? It, yes, it will say that something changes. What changes? Yeah, uh, and oh, what I direction? What that. direction is it going? Right? Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's let's jump back into mitochondrial hypertrophy, and you you posed that you know so so we we've kind of talked about how the mitochondria there's there's not really this thing mitochondrial biogenesis but there are still pgc1 alpha all of these other you know factors getting stimulated in order to add it's essentially like adding an addition onto your house rather yeah, than just that's like exactly starting what from it's square like one. you wouldn't say i built a new house you're like oh i thought you just remodeled yeah, yeah exactly so you're remodeling your mitochondria continually in response to exercise and yep. <clears throat> what what seems to occur and this is you're not going to find this in the actual review but based on the chris day paper that was just published for you is what this is what i think kind of occurs occurs is i think in the beginning it's like you have your duct work and it's easier to remodel and make that duct work or the the inside of your house more functional right than it is to just like add on a whole new addition So the first thing you do is you replace the appliances, you maybe move around some stuff, blow out a wall, do other things like that to make it more functional. So from that perspective, what you're doing is- Replace the doors, replace the trim. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You're you're adding granite countertops. Yeah. um, Getting rid of the, oh my gosh. Uh, In our house, we have the, it it just looks like like an Easter bunny decorated the whole thing. Yeah. Like, you know, everything is pastel colors and it's like bright and vibrant and stuff. But I'm just like, man, it's not modern whatsoever. And I'm like, <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> that's that's that was the decorator of choice at the time. Right. But what you would do is you would place, you know, the trim, the, you know, maybe get new new appliances, maybe get new faucets, do other things like that. And that's kind of what's happening when you first start to exercise you your mitochondrial function. So your ability to just use more oxygen actually goes up. And we still don't really know exactly what's going on with that, but it could be because of changes to the amount of folds that we have within the mitochondria. The folds are called cristae, and those cristae are what are kind of holding all of our our complexes. So complex one, two, three, and four, and then ATP synthase or complex five. And so first you make more folds, so you're taking up you're taking advantage of the the pre-existing pipes you're just making more surface area by making more folds in those in those pipes. And then what you can do is you can actually take all of your complexes, so your complex 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5, and you can actually form them together in certain ways that actually make them I don't want to say more efficient because it that it's a It does. A it's little... kind of like Voltron, right? They yeah. can kick ass as individuals, but when you really need to get things done, they come together to form Voltron to mm-hmm. save the day. Yeah, I, that's how I would kind of think of the super complex formation. Yeah, yeah. So, so then you take all of these proteins that you know. It's like I, when I visualize like the cell, it's just like things are floating around. Right. And I know that's probably not actually true, but you know, then you fold those up and like so. Then they're like on top of each other, and what that allows you to do is pass electrons more effectively. And there was this really interesting paper in like the, I don't know, pr- proceedings of of something in science or something, you know, PNAS. PNAS. Yeah, PNAS. <laughs> I always hear PNAS, yeah, and PNAS. my wife is always like, "What you just say?" I'm like, <laughs> "Yes, it's an article in PNAS, yes. the Procedures of Natu- of the National Academy of Sciences." Yes, PNAS. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so. So there was a paper that actually showed that that super complex formation doesn't actually make the mitochondria more efficient, 
but something happens to the membrane that's around that like uh, folded super complex that actually makes the electrons move faster or some crazy thing like that. It was, it kind of blew my mind at the time, and I can't remember exactly what happened, but it was it was one of those things where the the folding of those complexes and actually joining of different um, stoichiometries of those complexes, so you could have two complex one one complex three, complex four, and a complex five, or you could have, you know, other uh, Voltrons, you know, that are that are made up of different color. Uh, I don't even know what Voltron is, but... Um, <laughs> kind but of like, yeah. it was the precursor to Power Rangers. I also didn't watch Power Rangers, <laughs> but okay, so you could have two pink Power Rangers and a green one and a yellow one, or you could have two two green ones and a blue one and a and a pink one. The worst part um, of all of this is it seems like I did watch Power Rangers. <laughs> Not the case. I'm just familiar with it. Yeah. And no, that was okay. But I mean, that's kind of. <laughs> I, I almost went down like a Dragon Ball reference, and I, that no, we're not going to do that. So. um yeah, so all of but what it's pointing to is that it's you have a better ability either spatially or just temporally to to pass those electrons along more efficiently. So so those seem to be kind of like the two early adaptations that we would get. And then what starts to happen is then you start to be able to accumulate those additions on your house. So you start to accumulate those we additions. We added too much. We added so many features in <laughs> so many in windows. The given, <laughs> yeah, square footage. That now we have to expand. Right? It's yeah. just too tight in here. It is not functional. So now we're going to have to make the house bigger. Yes, exactly. So then you make the house bigger, and this is you know by adding you know a new movie room or you know a a new workshop or other things like that, and then you finally get to a point where you know you you've you've kind of started to take up quite a bit of your your area um and you say okay well uh, maybe it is time to actually start uh adding outbuildings and stuff like that and then you do the same thing with outbuildings and this is this would be a little bit of you know like that biogenesis but it's not really biogenesis because you'd probably take a portion of it and then you'd start to build it from there and it's always they're always like connected and reforming and and doing things like that. So you you have this continual functional change, folding, expansion, functional change, folding, expansion that's continually occurring as you get fitter and fitter and fitter and that's again it's all to maintain bioenergetic homeostasis as long as possible. Um so and so, possibly then accommodate the increases in heat with yes. a higher energy transfer. So I so I I love that because if we think about how, what a mito, what the mitochondria look like, you know, if you actually just do a cross section and look into them, they actually look like a heat sink as well. Really? Right? Yeah, so if you if you ever so I'm going back to my engineering days, but in order for something to be cooled, right? Say you have like a like a CPU or something on your computer, you can put a heat sink on top of it. And if you pull the the heat sink away, it's like this thing that goes up and down and up and down and up and down. And then it allows you to dissipate more heat because you have a larger surface area to actually yeah. dissipate that heat. Yeah. So I I know that's like a theory you're working on and we we won't necessarily talk about it right now, but well, that's great. I don't know I'm not steeped in engineering or physics, right? That's not my strong suit. So when I want to start to think about uh, some of the biological or chemical mm, outcomes, I'm totally limited on that. Mm -hmm. So that that's that's good info. Yeah. So so that could be another reason why having large mitochondrial volume density, you know, within the cell could be beneficial, right? Yeah. Is just larger surface area to be able to dissipate heat. We we know that mitochondria well mitochondria get really warm when when you're exercising. And I, I think I remember seeing a paper that was like fifty degrees Celsius or something like well, that. Well, so let's just start with the muscle. What do we know the yeah. muscle? The muscle itself can easily get above forty degrees Celsius. Yeah, that's which hot. is like a hundred and four ish degrees Fahrenheit. Um so we already know that like that's not debated. That's that's known. That's objectively been shown. 
And mm-hmm. so the question is, well, what's the temperature of the mitochondria? You would think that minimal, it would be, it would be in a thermal equilibrium with the muscle. So, so you would 40. think minimal, it may get up to around 40 or 43. Mm-hmm. But if you think 90 plus percent of the ATP that were fueling activity. So if mitochondria and I'm being generous is only taking up 10% of the cell, but it's producing. So the energy transfer for ATP has to be equivalent to the energy transfer in use, which is the remaining 90% of the cell. Mm -hmm. It just uh, anecdotally, theoretically may, I mean, maybe I sound ridiculous when I say this, but it makes sense in my little baby brain that it could be hotter because you have the uh, arguably about the same. If, if somebody's at maximal steady state metabolism, then you would think that the energy transfer through mitochondria needs to equal the energy transfer through the muscle. Mm-hmm. And so there should be. I, I guess I'm I'm assuming that all the efficiency of energy transfer is, is similar in mitochondrial versus sarcoplasmic components. Um, But there's more and more research to show. And actually the most recent just came out of a a lab. I've always known him as a Finnish uh, scientist. His last name is Jacobs, him or her. Actually, I don't, I don't know. I shouldn't say him. (laughs) The last name is Jacobs. um, and, And they work with mitochondria, but I now see an affiliation in Melbourne too. They've just shown that different mitochondria from different samples, they look at different mammalian and insect, they suggest can get 15 degrees hotter than the surrounding environment. Wow. So there's repeated evidence demonstrating or suggesting that mitochondria get around 10 to 15 degrees hotter than the surrounding cell. That's wild. That's warm. That's really warm. It's really warm. And when we respire it outside and doing high resolution respirometry, it's fixed at 37 degrees. Mm -hmm. And so that's obviously going to have an influence. Exactly. Well, it's not even resting. Resting skeletal muscle is like 34, 35. I actually think that the standard temperature should be 34, 35 to best represent resting because then post analysis, you can always do the temperature correction upwards mm. right well i was i was gonna say it'd be cool to do a, a series of experiments that would be like you know do it at resting with you know and then titrate in you know different different amounts of say adp or you know whatever you want and then do um you know in a in a working environment you know so 15 degrees oh, hotter totally. than that so like 50 so do a, a a resting condition and then a high condition and just totally. see how just just based off of that, how does respiration change? I agree. So the the chambers wouldn't wouldn't get that hot, and oh, they don't. and you start to lose stability of your measures. I think I put them up to like thirty nine or or forty once, and the measures get wild. Like yeah, it gets. It's probably it got to be something with like the. Uh the the o2 membrane but i like know. so your idea because it's not just temperature but it's also redox balance because overall right. redox balance changes and there's a paper from the east carolina uh, mitochondrial gurus that also show how respiration changes with redox balance so i like starting off at a low temperature with um a redox environment that that demonstrates rest mm-hmm. and then you change that redox environment depending on what your protocol is halfway through. And then afterwards you could do the temperature correction. You could, you could hit all bases. You could hit Mm -hmm. all bases rest with minimal energy demand, maximal exercise with with, with as much energy demand as somebody. Yeah. Yeah. That would be, that would be really cool. And that starts to put a little bit more of those puzzle pieces together because I think people don't take into account, you know, like we talk about it in exercise physiology, you know, temperature, pH, all of these things shift the ability for our enzymes to actually function correctly, but it's just always this generic curve, right? So something you mentioned to me today was that, you know, any DH actually isn't stable at certain temperatures, but are things like complex one, complex two, complex three, are those shifting their enzyme functionality based off of temperature, pH, 
other things like that. And then on top of that is the structure actually helping or hindering, you know, our ability to, to then dissipate heat. Cause I imagine, right. You know, we just talked about it. It's like you fold it first or you, you, you change the function, fold it. And then you have, you know, general mitochondrial hypertrophy is that hypertrophy actually of the mitochondria helping to dissipate heat across a larger surface area that's then able to transfer it into, you know, the cytosol and then to the, you know, the sarcolemma and then, you know, further up the chain. Um, yeah, that's super interesting. Um, but something I want to just dial us back into, and we can probably dive down this temperature rabbit hole again. Oh, actually, I just oh, thought about this. I'm sure we will. Yeah. No. Well, so I'm diving right back down to it. I'm not even taking this out. <laughs> uh, so, so because what I was thinking about is, you know, so we generally have we have two modalities of exer- two modalities, largely speaking, of exercise that are going to uh, cause preferential adaptations in in our mitochondria. We have volume, so a little bit lower intensity, more volume is going to actually help for mitochondrial volume. And then we have our high intensity stuff, which has been preferentially shown to increase mitochondrial function. So it's essentially like, you know, when you when you need to go fast, you need to be able to produce or use oxygen really fast and produce ATP really fast. So you get better function. If you're going to go slow, you, you know, you need uh, or it's it's just low and slow. You know, you kind of have that that volume volume proliferation um, or expansion of that mitochondria. And I wonder, is part of that based off of you know a, the temperature response, right? High intensity interval training definitely getting hotter <laughs> than you know your your low intensity high volume training. Even though you are probably sweat like I sweat. A ton during my zone two training but i tell you what i've been doing um you know those like 30 30s or 35 25s for vo2 max work and the last set i i feel so hot and it's like it's it's not like a oh man i'm pretty warm it's like i'm like cooking myself from the inside out sort of hot and i wonder if like that's like kind of the sign of like okay well my core body temperature is probably going over that like internal threshold and then that's you know because because it's it's very shortly after that where i'm just like toast like absolutely toast so that's i don't know that's just kind kind of kind of what i was thinking but um yeah what are your thoughts on that i think uh, yeah uh, of course i i think heat is a bigger player in controlling the limits of human performance than at least I've, I've realized in the past. And I've, I've given a a thought to, I have theories as to how temperature is, is probably influencing when we fatigue. I think it's related to lactate thresholds, whether or not you're talking about, well, especially I guess the onset of blood lactate, kind of that, that first threshold I would suggest that that's also coincidentally occurring where you're starting to recruit more fast twitch fibers that require more ATP Mm -hmm. uh, to respectively contract. And so you're going to increase the thermal stimulus right around the time you start seeing more uh, lactate in the bloodstream. And George Brooks has shown over the years that lactate threshold has little to nothing to do with hypoxia per se. So Mm -hmm. how else... Right? Uh, Could we be signaling? Exactly. Yeah. I think temperature, yeah, is uh, it opens up a lot of possibilities to explain questions that I've had regarding mitochondrial biology for a while. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the one of the one of the papers we read during my master's degree was like. <coughs> the seven homeostatic perturbations, you know, that actually stimulate adaptation. And I, I think, I don't even think heat was on it. I think that no, there was like so five either. or six. I have since incorporated that into seven. Yeah. So I think well, it was six. I, I want to go over that review with people because I think, you know, we're just going to keep, you know, layering down and diving down. But essentially what you have to think about again 
is that you know your your body the only impetus for your body to adapt is by placing a stress on it and when when we say stress you're like okay well it's like oh are you making it like you know are you making it cram for an exam or something like that it's like maybe but for the most part right it's it's either going to be you know some sort of energetic demand hypoxic or oxygen you know related demand um redox balance which is the balance between your electron suppliers and your electron you takers know, like the yeah takers yeah um you're you're going to have oh what are the other ones Con contraction that's a, so that's it's a big mechanical one. mechanical yep. itself the energetic stress itself yeah uh you said redox balance calcium uh um, oh calcium that calcium which is based off of you know the signal to actually contract Calcium increases directly in response to force, so you produce more force. Mm -hmm. it's, it's with more calcium. Temperature, yep. uh, reactive oxygen species, hypoxia. Yeah, there's a there's a, there's a lot of them, and that is how your body actually responds. And 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 really, you know, you have all these sensors within your cell that are like, oh, well, the energetic stress is turned up right now, so we need to adapt to be better at having or at, at reestablishing homeostasis based on the next energetic stress that's actually going to occur. And, you know, the adaptations to our mitochondria, the adaptations to the whole body would not be occurring if we did not have those sensors that were actually taking those signals, integrating them, and then telling the rest of the body how to adapt, telling those contractors, hey, we need more bricks here. Hey, we need a roof here. Hey, we need to do hey, we you know, need this, that, more and the other. Christe over in the living room <laughs> yes exactly we yeah we need more couches to sit on because there's going to be another person in the house um or more dogs i guess in, in my case yeah um so so yeah so i think i think that's where i want to go i hope everybody got a, a a good deep dive into this mitochondrial conversation i know uh you know sometimes the the way that we talk we just follow the rabbit holes and it's it's really fun um i'll try to that's why i try to have uh you know the different time points on all the different videos and everything so you can skip to the things that you actually want to listen to um if you guys have any have any questions you know you can always find me at critical02 on instagram um you can comment down below if you're on youtube you can even comment if you're on spotify there's uh questionnaires and i have seen some people respond to them and we do take that feedback that you give us seriously so uh, reach out there. Um, you can you can find Robbie on Zwift still, um, always riding. And uh, yeah, I think uh, w with that we'll we'll kind of leave you guys there. Do you have anything you want to leave the the listeners with? Go and get big ass slow twitch fibers. It's all about mitochondrial hypertrophy. We'll catch yeah. you guys in the next one.